Welcome to the World Cup of Martial Arts Between Rounds series. I'm Mike Petraca, and today we're honored to have an extraordinary guest, Soki William Sirio Ambrosia, a 10th degree black belt in Kempo Karate and a former standout amateur kickboxer. Soki Ambrosia is renowned for his proficiency in various weaponry and tactical self-defense. He's a respected figure in the martial arts community, recognized through multiple Hall of Fame inductions. Additionally, Soki Ambrosia is the stepson of the legendary martial artist, Professor Nick Sirio. Today, he joins us to share insights into his ongoing journey in martial arts, his current endeavors, and how his unique upbringing shaped his path. Let's delve into the life and legacy of a man who lives and breathes martial arts, Soki William Sirio Ambrosia. Hi everybody, this is Mike Petraka and welcome to the World Cup of Martial Arts Between Rounds segment. Here today we have a very special guest with me, Bill Rocco Ambrosia. He is a 10th degree black belt in Kempo Karate, a former standout amateur kickboxer, and he's demonstrated a proficiency in various weaponry and has led multiple self-defense and tactical seminars throughout the community and has been inducted in several Martial Arts Hall of Fame. And he is here to give us a little bit insight into what he's doing now and his journey. And he's also the stepson of legendary martial artist, Professor Nick Sirio. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy Absolutely. to be here. Absolutely. So tell, tell us, how, how did your martial arts journey start, Bill? It's actually a funny story. Um, when I was about four, my uh, my mother was dating Professor Serio. So um, about just four and a half, five years old, I was introduced to him. And uh, I was pretty blown away by meeting him. Uh, you know, one of the funny stories that we had that we talked about later in life um, was when he saw me and we shook hands. He goes, you know, if you kept your nails short, they'd be cleaner. And I was, <laughs> I was like, what? And I just never forgot that's that. Random, right? I mean, right, it was right. random. But, you know, it's a nice segue to go into a lot of other things with my father, with Professor Sirio. But, uh, you know, um, you know, he was memorable. And, and uh, he he always had a lesson for you in one way or another. You never, never really realized until later when you look back on it. And uh, so, but I had to join. I had to join the martial arts because my mother was training with them. And, and, and your was, mother, your mother was quite accomplished too, as well. Yeah, it's, yes, yes, she was the first black belt in in Rhode Island, maybe even New England, but in Rhode Island for sure. Amazing! My father's first yeah, female black belt, and in Rhode Island. Yeah. Amazing! So you, so you had it. So you already had you had it from like both sides, you know. Yes, mom and with that. Yes, well, she started with him, training with him, but she was always in a physical activity. Uh, she liked fencing, boxing. Mm. Yeah, so. <laughs> And yes. you're and you're continuing the tradition now at your school. Yes, yes, I'm continuing. I'm teaching. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in my patch, but I'm teaching Nixio's Kempo as well as Lido Kan Kempo. Yes. And you know, b back in the day when when I was younger, like you know, probably 25 years ago, and and studying Kempo, there were like there was like the Mount Rushmore when I was younger in Rhode Island. You know, there was there was George Pizzari, who I studied with at his at K Delgaco for a while. And then there was Don Rodriguez. And then the other big figurehead is Nick Sirio. Right, those, yeah. when I was younger, were like, those are the three prominent ones for, for me. Yeah. For me. The trifecta of martial arts. Yes. Um, so that's true. And each one, uh, you know, carry their own legend and, 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 and have propelled martial arts to another level. And um, Master Rodriguez now is the only one left in that legacy and has done tremendous for, for the martial arts community. I talk, talk to my students about that often, actually. And and tell me a little bit about, um, you know, your, your younger years. I know you were very accomplished, right? Amateur kickboxer fight fighting on the, what, the Friday night fights? Friday night fights. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we, yes. You know, Eddie and I are trying to bring that back, by the way. In the That's going to be great. Art. So we're going to, we're going to have to fill you in on that too. But yeah, t tell me about that experience and like, the old days versus like the new days. Uh, uh great. I'm happy to. So um in the old days when that when my father was starting the uh Friday night fights, 
I wanted to do it too. And at that time, I was pushing 12 years old. So he was training me with the other guys, and they were 19, 20, and, and, and up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I wanted to do it too. So uh, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, but I was also competing. And mm. so when competing, you're not supposed to kick him in the head and punch him in the face. So now I start so kickboxing him and I'm pulling my punches and my kicks and my father's working on me. It's like, listen, you, you got to hit him. You're boxing. So, okay. Yeah. I, did that. I, I, I got the hang of it really quickly. When you're in the ring and you're getting hit, you're going to learn to hit back. Absolutely. So now I go to a tournament and bow here, bow to the judge, bow to each other, ready to go. Bang, bang, pow. You can't do that in, in, in tournament. So yeah. I was kind of disqualified. So when I was about 16 years old, they said, listen, you got to make a choice. You're going to have to stick with the kickboxing or your martial arts. And I mm -hmm. and I chose to just train just train and continue in my tournament circuit, if you will. You know. And you and you had um you, you had an injury as well, right? That you had a, I, I was a uh, auto accident that yes, that horrible kind of cut things a little short. Very. It was put things on pause, I should say, and changed my path and my a lot, but all for the better in the end. So it was October 13th, 1985. There was a tournament to raise money for a new organization at the time called the Impossible Dream. Mm. And, um, you know, the trophies were going to be very, very small. And of course, there were rated competitors going. If you could beat a rated competitor, you could get more points. Sure. So the ranking system rating system was a little different back then but anyway so i went to compete had a wonderful time i do have some video of it ironically enough but um on my way back leaving i was taking someone home after the tournament and we're going down a road and there was a guy who was drunk yeah the center line and wasn't his first offense and he passed the center line and I had no time really to hit the brakes or the horn, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I just turned the wheel in such a fashion where, you know, the passenger wouldn't get hit. Now, I took the blunt of the hit. I turned through my body on top of that person. So my face hit the windshield, cut mm -hmm. my face open, broke my ribs, all my ribs on my left side and my right knee. Wow. So, yeah, 356 stitches in my face. And it was a big repair. It was a big recovery. And the doctors said, you know, you'll never compete again. You got to hang your gloves up. I remember them telling me that. It took that, me that, that must have been, you, you remember it. Pretty I do time. remember that. I did. It, it took me three years to compete again, but I did. And, uh, yeah, I was out of the hospital in less than a month. They said I would be there for months, but I was out in, in, in not long at all because of, I believe, you know, and going off on another tangent, the martial arts is more than punching and kicking and blocking. It's a mindset, you know, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that my attitude determines your altitude. And, and, and I was just determined to get out because I wanted to compete in a very special tournament called Big Bermuda Invitational Grand Championships. Uh huh. Uh huh. But I wasn't able to make it. Um, I didn't, I wasn't recovered. It, it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. But then you know, that was in April of 85, I believe. I'm pretty sure. But um, yeah, that didn't happen. But I was driven to come back, you know, well, so that, I jump the rope on one leg, you know. <laughs> so that, that's, that, that's the thing that there's this, this wonderful, um, just to tie it into, you know, a little bit of what I do too about the therapy perspective. There's this wonderful therapy, uh, existential therapy and this guy Victor Frankel talks about exactly the same thing that you did where he was he writes this book Man's Search for Meaning and he talks about how he was in the harshest conditions you know of a concentration camp you know in, in Nazi Germany and he talked about how what drove him every day to just keep going when others might might have given up because of course of the harshest circumstances but he wanted to get back to his work and that meaning and that drive kept it on the forefront of his mind to just keep going, to get up every day, to just keep going. And I think that that's such a valuable lesson that, like you said, martial arts teaches as well, is that you need to have something to, to, to dr drive you or look forward to and give you meaning, even in the darkest of circumstances. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm no stranger to recovery and, and picking yourself up off the floor and, and going forward. You mm. know, because when I was, you know, everyone who's going to be listening to this don't don't know what I'm about to say. I was born physically handicapped. Mm. And the doctor said to my mother at the time, you know, listen, he has this terrible condition and he's going to be very uncoordinated in life, out of shape and won't live to be 30. Wow. And maybe all of that would have been true if I hadn't joined the martial arts. Now, when I did join, I had a very serious balance and coordination problem. And I have to say, Professor Serio, he, I, I believe he was going by Sensei then. Mm. He changed it because, you know what? I'm sure he had empathy for me, mm. but wouldn't sympathize with me and just kept pushing me forward. And I, But mm. the thing is, is I was so stubborn, determined to be the man for my mother. You know, mm. I'm going to take care of my mother and, and I'm going to make sure that I can do these martial arts. But I had a balance problem, bruising balance. Bruising, serious bruising, nose bleeding easily. Here you wow. are in a contact sport. Yeah, you know, we didn't have the kind of so, uh, the equipment that we have today, um, and I would I would feel the wrath of getting whacked and hit from sparring. But it didn't matter. I had to keep going. And my father, well, at the time, he he was um, I wasn't calling him dad when I first started. Mm. You know, he was professor or uh, not professor? It was sensei, right? And, uh, but I was respectful to him. Uh, he he just really was adamant about the, no excuses. You know, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it, or don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. What, what was what was talk about the mental aspect of it? What what techniques or lessons that maybe you still apply today helped you then, and you still practice now in terms of that that mental strength. Well, as a youth, um, I would be difficult to to address that because I wasn't mature enough about the lessons, mm -hmm. right? Um, other than the going forward and there's no crying, <laughs> you know, uh, but it was following up. My father was very adamant about following up on the things that, A, you say you're going to do, mm -hmm. or B, when you're actually doing your techniques or sparring, you have to follow up. You set the trap and then you follow through. Mm. So when I remember that as a youth, um, and he actually taught me the waiting game because everyone was bigger than me when I was sparring in tournaments. I mean, everyone was. Yeah. I was a tiny guy. Uh, so I wait for them to make their move. And, and it was a beautiful. In fact, in 1972, was the my most favorite tournament ever was because uh, my father didn't judge that day. He just watched me and coached me on the side. Uh -huh. Everyone was bigger than me. It was it was the Cape Cod Classics. Glenn Hart had it. Okay. It was, it was the trophy was only this big. It was a little guy kicking, but I loved it because my dad was there the whole time. Yeah, you know? yeah. I was about um, five and maybe six years old when I I was playing with a yo-yo, standing on a chair, and I said he was getting ready to go to work. And I said, "Can I call you dad?" He said. He just, you know, this moment of silence, you know, I'm sure he was honored or blown away, whatever. He was, of course you can, you know. Mm. So, and then he married my mom about that time anyway, so. Well, that, but that must have meant a lot to you. It was great. It was beautiful. Yeah. I was in the wedding party. I don't know my position, but I had yeah. a tuxedo like everybody else did, you know, <laughs> and I was really honored and proud of that. It was a great time. It was a great, great time, you know. Absolutely. That's amazing. what. What was he like in the corner? What, what 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 types of advice did he give you in the corner for that tournament? He said, "This guy's going after your head. Wait, block, and counter, mm. and then follow through with the front kick because he's going to back up." And it, it worked like a charm. It was great. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. We had to go back later that night for the finals. You know, and Glenn Hart. I, I was using the name Serial. In fact, everyone watching would know me as Bill Serio, right? Mm -hmm. So Glenn Hart's narrating, and little Billy Serio's out there. Hey, look at that <laughs> counter. <laughs> it was yeah, yeah, that, that great hearing your name, you know, your name. Uh, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. And it rolls off. And it's yeah, great. it was wonderful. I'll never forget that. But that, that was like probably one of my most favorite memorable tournaments anyway. There's been so many, but that one really stands out. Yeah. That's that's that, that's amazing. So yeah, I can tell you have so many great stories, and 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 you know he he lives on. I'm looking to. I think it's your right. It's my left. I'm looking at that great photo over yes, there. Over right it looks here. like yeah yeah yeah. It a smaller like version. It. I happen to have it on my desk. If you'd like to see it. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd love this to. is a smaller I'd love to. version. 
Oh, so that's amazing. What happened was a student of mine cropped my dad in here, but really in the front of my dojo was my my father and my mother, and I just was standing there in an odd guard position because I consider myself their right hand man. Right, right. You know, to both of them, you know. Right. And and I'm carrying forward my father's teachings as well as my mother's. You know, Professor Serio and Soke Nancy Serio, I'm carrying it forward. And I'll say to them, this is from the Nick Serio's Kempo system. This is how mm -hmm. we learn this, you know. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I love it. I'm honored to do this, carry it forward, and it's really a passion. You know, I was saying to, I was saying to uh, someone just the other day, this just isn't something that I do. It's something right, right. who I am. You, yeah, you live it. You live it. Yeah. Yes, you live it. So. And that's just, it's not for everybody to live it like that. Some people, they'll train for four, five, ten years, and they're done, and they move on. It's America. You can do that. Right, But for right. me, this has always been my passion. This is what I do. I also, you know, I also do, is, and I've learned a lot from, I, I work with some special needs kids at different schools. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, want, I want people to know what you're doing right now at the Ambrosia Serio Martial Arts School, yes. present day. Yes. Well, I, as I said, I work with special needs children. I don't know if I can say the names of the schools. One mm -hmm. is called the Sergeant Center. It's in Warwick, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And another one is two locations, Pathways, one in yep. Coventry and one in uh, Warwick or West Warwick. And in any case, some of the kids you work with are nonverbal. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. might be hard of hearing. Some might be vision in, you know, impaired. Um, some may not be able to move an arm. Some may not be able to stand. It doesn't matter. And mm. I, I just feel as though I can adapt to any individual and help them. And these kids are just, you know, the teachers will look at me like, because I'll say, listen, if I have to keep telling you the same thing over and over again, I'm not going to punish you, but I am going to give you push-ups. But they're not punishment mm. push-ups. It's helped me to help you to learn because right. I love what I'm doing. I right. care about you and I want you to learn. And these are these are helping push-ups and I'll do it with them. This is what we have to do. Then you have to ask yeah. permission to get so up. So you, mo you model that. that thing yes, and I do it with them. And the teachers look at me like, this isn't going to happen. But then you see their jaws drop and these kids do it. I want to do push-ups. The next kid says, mm -hmm. it's like, no, no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not. A challenge in that way, you know, but they challenge themselves to do do the let's call it the right thing or do the move right. that we're doing. We talk right. about the principles of conduct, you know, how you're not supposed to hit your friends and family with this or just show off in the in the mm -hmm. schoolyard, you know, effort, etiquette, sincerity, character and self-control. Mm, I like that. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that that's something what we talked about just a few moments ago. That that you learned from from Professor Sirio is that that you know you you have the the empathy right, yeah. but then you also have to push them a little bit too, yeah. so as not to to pity right, right? so that exactly they can right. improve. So I I mean, can there, there's them. a lesson right there that you yeah. it sounds like you've been able to implement and adapt in a wonderful way. You know, and I tell my students too. Some students are like I'm not learning fast enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. It's like listen, I will not lose. You will win because I'm going to win helping you to achieve your goals. You will be successful. It will happen. Everyone runs at a different pace. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I just don't grow out of patience. I, I, you know, you know, I didn't mention, you know, when I had that condition, that, that, that uh, condition where I, I was uncoordinated, right. When I was very young and I bruise easy, you know, I had to learn to overcome that. I had to learn to work around my, let's call them weaknesses, Sure. Okay, and create stronger strengths. My father and my mother helped me do that tremendously, actually. You know, they really did. You know, uh, you know, the cat's out of the bag now. People know, oh, I never knew he had that. Yeah, you know, I had a famous uh taekwondo I say to my father, listen, Billy's kicks are unbelievable. Could he come to the studio and train with us? My father goes and tells me, and I said, Did he say le legs are beautiful? plural or singular he said plural. he said legs i know i never kicked with one leg just i only kicked with one leg not the other yeah and i'm just not yeah. gonna say which one it is how's that <laughs> <laughs> right I, and he didn't know that right he didn't know so yeah because the other leg would bruise really badly like mm. not even no not not good 
So, uh, yeah, it's a vascular condition that I was born with. Vascular, okay. But I overcame that. Yeah, I overcame that. And um, and I owe it, you know, I, I you know, if my father, if Nick Serio didn't come into our lives, I don't know where I would be. And look at the people I can help. You know, I really love that. Mike. Well, that that's one of the, and that's the best thing, right? I, I always tell people, you know, my, my profession too, it never gets old helping yeah. people achieve their goals. Absolutely. You know, never. Yeah, absolutely. No. You know, and, and, and it just, it fills you up every single time, you know, you're able to, to pay it forward and give that back. Yes. Yes. And that's what I'm doing, paying it forward. And, and, you know, if ever I don't know something, I will say I don't know. And I'll look that up. I'm not going to just fabricate something. Right. So it's very important because you know what? I, I got these two behind me. I got my father over here. My mother's over here, you know, uh, and, you know, I, it's the honor of teaching the art and being true to the art. And I got to do it. And this is what I'm doing. That, 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 that's awesome, Bill. But, and and I, I can tell, you know, you, you can tell when someone loves what they do and lives it because, because the passion in your voice, it, you know, it, it, it's there. You know, and, and I think everybody, you know, who's who's going to view this will be able to tell as well. Um, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. And I'm, I'm very glad to do that. And like I said, I teach kids from five years old, you know, up to, you know, I, I say 99. I, I had one gentleman. He's 97. 97. He's 97 Holy years God. old. It was a couple of years ago. He took some classes with me. What a great guy. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, when, on the on the classes that I teach for the special needs at other schools, you know, some of them are taking privates with me, which I, you know, mm. I reduced the cost of it because I, I want to help so badly right. that I, I'm trying to find a class just here at the studio so they can come here. I yeah. haven't found that time so getting to have enough people, you know, but so I want to make a class for them so they can interact. You know, we talk about politeness and kindness, respect, what does effort mean and, and other mm. principles of conduct, you know, right. and, um, yeah, all those important things story. outside of the combat aspect. Yeah, actually, yes. the actual art of it. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and you know, as my advanced students advance, they start seeing things as far as the as far as the techniques of what they're learning, mm -hmm. and they think, oh, they see this piece meet with this piece, and they're like, oh, wow, I see how that works. And then you step back, and they're like, wait a minute, this meets with this, and then, whoa, it's a whole new picture, and then yeah, they have yeah, a new, yeah, a whole new perspective. And they'll repeat the things that I said that they will once say, and one time they will see this, and they and you see that light bulb go on on anybody from any 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 level. Absolutely, it's a beautiful feeling, and and it makes me know that I'm doing I'm doing the right thing. God called me to do this. So, and and tell me what what types of styles? So if somebody comes to your school, what types of styles do you offer? So I want to make sure we that's get a, that. Out that's there a great too. question. That's a great question. Primarily, the name of our studio is Serial Ambrosian Martial Arts. That's the name of the studio. We're teaching Lee Del Con Kempo, which means Lee's House of Kempo, mm -hmm. and Nick Serial's Kempo. Now, over the course of the decades of my training, I have trained at other locations, other places, okay, mm -hmm. with other individuals, with permission from my teachers, of course. Sure. So, um, you know, I have a funny story where I went to California to shake the hand of Leo Fong, Master Leo Fong, because he had sent a book to my, for me to give to my mother. I'd asked him. I, I reached out to him. She had lost a lot of stuff in a fire at her apartment. Mm. And one of the things that she lost I wanted to get was a, a book by Leo Fong. So I contacted and reached out to him and um, back in 2012. I wanted to have a birthday for my mother, 12, 12, 12, because she was born December 12, 1942. But on 12, 12, 12, she was going to be 70, you know, it's going yeah, to be yeah, a big, big thing. So I reached out to him to get this book, but he was in the Philippines at the time. You know, while he was in the Philippines, he bought the book for her and signed it. And I had given it to her. She was so delighted. Oh, that's very well, special. I went to Hawaii first to train. With Professor Kimo Ferrara, it was a beautiful. That was a that was a great. I got great stuff with that. But and then after that, I flew to California just to shake the hand of Leo Fong, Master Fong, just to shake his hand. Just to shake his hand. Huh? He knocks on my door at my hotel. I'm I'm not even. I'm sleep deprived here. I'm in my pajamas. He goes, "Oh, yeah. Bill, <laughs> hi." I'm. I was like, Master Fong, nice to meet you. I'm going to teach a seminar. Do you want to come? You got to say yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, can get, I brush get, my get, teeth? Get your pants on. Get on, on, get on a get shirt. And get on there. Yeah. So get, I go there, get, and uh, he's teaching some drills, and I want to stick with his drills. And then he said, "Pick a partner." And I look for the biggest guy, 
And so I get with this biggest guy there, and we're doing the drills. And you know your peripheral vision. People are stopping, and they're just stopping, and they're watching us and surrounding us, right? And uh, he stops us. He goes, I got to apologize to everyone. This is Professor Serio and Nancy Lee Serio's son. Um, this is, you know, William R. Ambrosia Serio. And, and, yeah. and so they were clapping. So this man comes up to me, Art Camacho, I believe his name was, who has sunglasses. He goes, how long have you been an FMA man? And I promise you, Mike, I didn't know what that was. I was like, I don't understand. Yeah. It was Filipino martial arts. I'm like, no, it's Kempo. It says it right down on my pajamas. On the bottom, it said on the side, it was actually sweatpants. It said Kempo on the side. Because that's no yeah. Kempo I haven't seen. I said, with all due respect, if you haven't seen Kempo. Kempo has incorporated a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, it's like a mixed martial arts, right? Right, right. A lot of Filipino techniques with the, with the sticks, how the, how the angles that they're using. And if you look at some of the Nick Sales Kempo, you know, the forms with the, the block and the parry, mm -hmm. the with an outward, you got, you, you got, they're doing their hubud drill or their vertical gunting drill, right? And yeah. it's a different, so you got east and west, and but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it all merges to get efficient martial arts will merge. Mm, they work. I like that. They work. Yeah, they work. So, and, and, and so when I, I am able to teach knife combat, uh, of course, I assisted my mother teach at the Rhode Island Municipal Police Academy. I was an mm -hmm. assistant or a uh, Uke that got beat up by everybody, but I loved it. Uke, was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As an Uke, you get beat up. Yeah. Yeah. So handgun retention, uh, cuffing techniques. So I work with my higher level ranking students on those things. They have to be brown belt or up. I'm going to work sure. with Makes sense. With that. Um, and, uh, and, and I like in the kickboxing, you think about the kickboxing is I incorporated the Kempo in the kickboxing. Mm. So I started off with cardio. Some ladies just want to do cardio kickboxing because they don't want to get in the ring. And I respect that. Sure. And everybody so has different goals, the, of course. Exactly. So they're just working the, the, the jab cross hook up a cut. Now I'm incorporating things I learned from master Fong and with that, my Kempo's involved with that, the footwork, the, you know, the, the, the switching of the feet with yeah, the, foot, the yeah. switch kick, which is, um, you know, savat. So, so again, I don't mean to repeat myself, but efficient martial arts. Efficient martial arts, different connect. styles, it's all coming into one change. union. Right. It's not much of a change. It really isn't. So, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. You know, Kempo, you know, a lot of people might say that Kempo uh, is a slapstick art. Mm, they're not seeing. They're not really seeing the the whole picture. Mm. You know, basically, if you take any of your forms in kempo and you put two knives in your hands, you see that you're doing some slicing and dicing. Right, right. You know, it's a little bit more advanced down the line of piece, but it's very real. Of course, of course, you know? no real real life application. I I, I found that that yeah. speech as well. Just the, the you know the shuto knife hand. Mm. says a lot right there. Mm. <laughs> so right, right. Yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to split atoms with you here on this, but it, basically, what what's going on here is, you know, once you see the whole picture, mm. it just keeps growing and right, right. It's like, it's like it's like it's like the matrix. Once you yes. understand it, there's yes. a lot of friend. Everything all kind of comes together. So Kempo has a lot of Kung Fu and it has Chinese and Japanese, you know, movements. You know, there's Kempo with spelt with an N. And Kempo, Kempo spelled with an M. So the Jap the M is more Japanese and the N is more Chinese. Oh, so interesting. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize that. That's yeah, interesting. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which, uh, of course, it was once called Chuan Fa, which meant China here. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm going off on tangent, but I also teach history, which is very important. Oh, that's amazing. That's How great. do you know where you're going to go if you don't know where you came coming from? You know? History, of course. I, I, I always love my, my history. Yeah, it's very. It does tend to repeat itself. And again, in the end, you have no that's where I I capitalize on. If I don't know something, I'm going to be sure to say, you know, I don't know because I don't want to spread any. And nonsense. I think I think I think people respect that, you know. Yeah. Um, well, Bill, this has been amazing. Thank you yes. so much for for taking the time. I know people are going to love this this interview, and um, God, I, I know we 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 talked to so much more. This is, this gives people a little a little taste, you know, what what's their appetite. <laughs> As we conclude our enlightening conversation with Soki William Sirio Ambrosia, it's evident that his journey in martial arts is not just a testament to his physical prowess, but also to his resilience, adaptability, and dedication to teaching. From overcoming personal challenges to becoming a 10th degree black belt and continuing the legacy of his stepfather, Professor Nick Sirio, 
Soki Ambrosia's story is an inspiration to us all. His commitment to the community, especially through his work with special needs children, showcases the true spirit of martial arts beyond the dojo. We thank Soki Ambrosia for sharing his profound insights and experiences with us, reminding us that martial arts is more than a discipline, it's a way of life that shapes character, fosters growth, and inspires others. Thank you, Soki Ambrosia, for joining us on the World Cup of Martial Arts Between Rounds series, and to our audience. Keep pursuing your passions with dedication and heart, just as Soki Ambrosia has. Until next time, stay inspired and keep pushing the boundaries of your own potential. This is Mike Petraka coming to you from Between Rounds. If you're interested in training at Kama Martial Arts, you can visit them at www.mykama.com. To learn more, you can call 401-295-1220.